Hello and welcome back to our channel. My topic today is compensatory versus non-compensatory spousal support. What's the difference? Well, let's start at the beginning. First, when we're talking compensatory versus non-compensatory spousal support, we're talking about your basis of entitlement to spousal support. So clearly, firstly, you have to be entitled to, to um, spousal support in the very first place. So that's number one. And then it's important for for us to, um, for you, if you're the, you're the recipient or payor of, of spousal support, to understand the basis of this entitlement. And so the um, a person may be entitled on a compensatory versus non-compensatory um, spousal support. And it's important because it helps inform the um, analysis on how the spousal support um advisory guidelines would apply in your case. I'll give you a little bit, a uh, few examples shortly. And thirdly, you need to remember that the fact that you have a large equalization payment coming to you does not affect your basis of entitlement, okay? You may still be entitled to spousal support regardless of the fact that you've got a large equalization um, payment. So, why is the basis of your entitlement important? Well, first off, it helps determine how much you should get. Remember how I just said a minute ago that, you know, it informs the analysis on, on the um, spousal support advisory guidelines. I'm going to call it the SAGs, okay, just because it's easier. So here's what I meant by that. So the SAGs give you um, a range of amounts for spousal support as opposed to child support where here's your income, here's the amount that's um, payable. The SAGs give you a low, mid, and high range. Now, your basis of entitlement to, to spousal support determines where within that range you should fall. So clearly, a person with a stronger compensatory um, spousal support claim is entitled to the high end versus the low end. In fact, your basis of entitlement could determine um, or could, could be the reason why we could even go make an exception and go outside of, of the, the SAGs. So an example is someone with you know, a non-compensatory basis for spousal support, well, there could be an argument made in that case that they should go below, they should get below the low end of the SAGs, right? So that's, in that case, we're talking about making an exception and going outside of the ranges. Um, another important reason why the basis of entitlement matters is a lot of times when you're dealing with support issues, um, it's not dealt with, you know, the very same month, same day that parties separate. And when you put time, um, in the, the, the time that it takes to resolve these issues, you find that people's incomes change. So if there is a post-separation increase in the payor's income, well, there's an argument as to whether or not it's appropriate for the ex to be able to benefit from that. Well, if you have a strong compensatory um, basis for receiving spousal support, then there's that um, entitlement to that post-separation increase in income, which may not be applicable to someone whose um, basis of entitlement is not compensatory. And then uh, lastly, and well, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is just the last thing I'm going to list. It's remarriage and repartnering. So if the recipient goes into, you know, a new marriage or a new common law relationship, well, if their, if their basis of entitlement is compensatory, then spousal support will continue regardless of the fact that they've repartnered. If, however, it's just, it's non compensatory, that could be, there could be an argument that now that they're in a new relationship, that spousal support or to terminate or be varied or whatever the case may be. So it's important. Again, um, I mean, I should, I want to mention again, um, or oh, one more thing, which is duration, right? So the basis of your entitlement sometimes could have, um, an effect on, on the duration, which is all part of the, the SAG analysis that I'm speaking to. So anyhow, now that you know that, you know, you need to be entitled to spousal support and the, your basis of, you need to be entitled to spousal support to start and that your basis of entitlement um, determines a lot. It is important, determines how much you should get, for how long you should get it, whether, how what income is used in calculating that spousal support, you know, whether exceptions should be made to shift outside of the SAGs or, and whether or not your repartnering should be 
um, an issue um, to very or terminate spousal support. Now that you know all of that, um, you see that it is pretty important to know the basis of entitlement. So let's talk about how they differ. Compensatory claims are generally based on the recipient's economic losses or disadvantage as a result of the role they adopted during the marriage. So you're thinking, you know, things like, um, you know, persons that took on more traditional roles during the marriage. And I, I will give a few more examples later, but I think for now I would just leave it as um, the, comp the compensatory claim is based on the recipient's economic loss or disadvantages as a result of the roles that they adopted during the marriage or even the roles that they have to adopt post-separation. Think, you know, relationships with children and one person being the primary parent, that sort of thing. So that is the compensatory claims. The non, um, so in terms of the non-compensatory claims, on the other hand, you're, you're dealing with, you know, it's usually based more on economic dependency. So not so much the roles that are adopted. It's just the, the loss of the standard of living um, as a result of the breakdown of the relationship is one of the common markers of a non-compensatory claim. So going back to the compensatory claims, um, you know, examples, if, you, if you're trying to figure out where your basis of entitlement falls, well, think things like, you know, where are we looking at a scenario where one party was a stay-at-home full-time parent to the children or maybe was just a secondary earner with one main breadwinner and you know we have a lot of time one party is the main breadwinner and another person just works part-time but primarily manages the home well in those cases you might be looking at compensatory um support if, um, you know, think cases where have you had to move, for example, right? So if parties with one party had to, to move multiple times to accommodate the other um, person's career, then that could be a marker for a compensatory claim. If, um, you know, supporting the payor's education and training, right, which happens in a lot of scenarios, you know, one person... Every, you know, the family prioritizes one person's career, prioritizes their education while the other person takes more of a home management responsibility or just earns to support the other person's career or even works around the other person's career, right? In terms of like moving, the hours that they're able to work, the kind of jobs that they're able to take. So um, that th those um, factors could lead to um, a compensatory claim. Another um, factor is a scenario where one person is working in, in a family business, for example. So essentially supporting one person that's going to be living with this asset while maybe all that we're doing in that business may not be skills that are necessarily transferable or that would pay them the same um, level of income. So those are sort of the things that we look at. Obviously, these are not, um, not exhaustive lists, but it just gives you just something to get you thinking as what your basis of entitlement might be. Length of marriage is a major one. And it just makes sense because a lot of times in longer term relationships, there's a lot of um, support, um, you know, growth and, and all of that. And for the most part, it usually would em em entail people, you know, making sacrifices and supporting each other. So in those kinds of scenarios, the longer you find that the longer the, the marriage, the like more likely that there will be a compensatory basis to spousal support. Now, having said that, not every long-term marriage is going to give rise to compensatory support. Not, every, not all of it. So length of marriage, while it may be a factor, it cannot just be that in and of itself that grounds the, the compensatory claim. So anyhow, so those are some of the things you should look at when looking at whether or not you do fit within the compensatory um, basis of, um, for spousal support. You have to realize that when you're when you're doing this analysis of where you fall um you know in terms of basis of entitlement there's some mistakes that i would like you like you to avoid so an example is a lot of people focus on where you know the person was at the start of the relationship 
as opposed to where they would have been if they continued in the labor market. And what I mean by that is, um, I'm going to give an example here. So someone might say, well, when we met, they were, you know, they were a, oh, what job? I'm, what job would be a good idea? Let's just say they were a waiter, for example, right? And so by, by being a waiter, they, you know, parties get married. One, the other party, the payor becomes the breadwinner and the waiter now becomes the home manager, maybe still waiting, um, being a waiter part-time. Now, if we look at, when we're looking, and let's say fast forward 20 years later, there's a breakdown in the relationship. Well, we can't just say, well, they were a waiter when I met them and, you know, and that's like, they've not really suffered any economic disadvantage as a result of the marriage. That's not necessarily accurate because, you know, the idea is, well, that waiter could potentially have been a restaurant owner if they didn't have to subordinate their own you know, career and um, business goals and aspirations to support someone. So that's the first thing. It's not just where they were at the beginning of the relationship is where they could have been if, um, you know, they didn't have to sacrifice for the other party. Hence the need for the compensation for the economic loss and disadvantage they, they've suffered. Um, you also have to be mindful that the fact that you've worked all through the marriage does not um, prevent you, you from having a compensatory basis of entitlement. So, you know, a lot of people work, but they're working to support the other person. They're working to accommodate the needs of the um, other person as well. So that's something that, you know, is, that's something you should also put in mind or have in mind when you are thinking about that. Like, yes, the person has worked all through, but is there, was there a possibility that they could work um, some or work, have a different career, progress differently in their career if they didn't have to, you know, suffer those economic losses for the benefit of the other um, spouse. And there's also, so, but that's enough with the compensatory basis of entitlement. I'm going to jump now to sort of the markers for the non-compensatory basis of support. And really, when you're looking at non-compensatory, well, it's, Clearly, no, not uh, it, it, you, you're looking at a marriage that lacks some of these elements that I've just described. However, even in those contexts, spousal support is appropriate because there's there's this economic interdependency, and so when the marriage ends, um, they're going to now lose, I guess, some of the financial benefits that they had as a result of being in the marriage, and and you can describe this as need, but when I say need in this context, I'm not talking about, you know, a, someone being destitute or just actually a need in the um, simple terms. Need in this case just means need in relation to the family standard of living. So, um, you know, you're talking about need in terms of an inability to meet the standard of living that the person, the recipient enjoyed during the marriage. So... For non-compensatory, you're looking at things like the length of the relationship, um, the drop in the standard of living for the recipient after the date of separation and the economic hardship that the recipient would experience as, as a result. And for um, non-compensatory um, claims, I find that a lot of times people, you know, the payor would look at it from the perspective of, well, this, the other party has a job, they're self-sufficient, so they should be able to take care of themselves. Um, they don't need support from me. And they're thinking, you know, need in that sense of ability to meet basic needs. That's not necessarily the case. The fact that a person has a very well-paying job does not mean that they would not be entitled to spousal support on a needs basis. Need, again, is in the context of the standard of living that the family enjoyed or that the, the parties enjoyed while the marriage was ongoing and that the other party, the recipient in this case, would lose if the um, because the relationship is now over. And it's really that simple. So even if the person is making, you know, $500,000 a year, which a lot of people will consider to be great income and would not think of need in that context, well depending on on the income of the payer it may be appropriate to 
um, get support on a needs basis, even if compensation might not be um, an appropriate basis of entitlement to spousal support. So what are the differences? Well, one is based on the role that a party adopted during um, the marriage or relationship, while the other is just based on the loss of the marital standard of living. That really is what it boils down to. And so when you're looking at the role that the one party took in the relationship, it has to be, you know, a role that led to them suffering some kind of economic disadvantage as a result. And, you know, as I said earlier, there's different markers to look at, moving for the other person's career, you know, working part-time, being the primary caregiver to the children, that sort of thing. That's the compensatory basis of spousal support, while the non-compensatory basis of spousal support, we're just focused on the loss, the economic interdependency that has a reason as a result of the marriage and the loss of that marital standard of living. So I hope you found this uh, video informative. I know it's heavy stuff because when you're dealing with the basis of entitlement to, to support, you are really going, you know, legal there. But um, I hope that I helped simplify things a little bit. And I hope that when you're thinking about spousal support and when you're trying to determine how much you're entitled to, that you're able to, you know, make reference to this video and that it is helpful for you. It's also helpful for you, obviously, when you're having conversations with, with your lawyer to help you understand where, you know, or why certain amounts are being proposed and things like that. So I have done my best to simplify what is an otherwise very, um, it's a very heavy legal analysis. Um, and I hope you found it helpful. If you have any questions, please drop it in the comments and, um, do subscribe to our channel if you haven't done that already. And until next time, it's bye for now.